yourself. But that's the in this episode, we had a broken spring. We did the engineering. We cut out a piece of steel in order to replace the one that was broken. We bent it to shape. It got welded together, heated up and quenched. That made it very hard. After it was heated up and quenched, we were able to do a little bit of polishing. We set it down inside of a pot of lead to draw its temper back a little bit. We tested to make sure that things that were heat treated would flex in the vise and that things that weren't would just explode. And they did. After we got it out of the lead, we mounted it on the lock and sparks viola. This two-piece spring was the original spring that was f furnished with the lock, and, and it had broken a long time ago. And somebody had silver soldered it together, which drew the temper on the spring all the way back to zero. And it wouldn't hold tension, and they had a wedge stuck in here, and it just didn't work. But the fact that it's in two pieces illustrates something that I want to show you. There's an upper and a lower. And the only piece of this spring that's actually doing any work is the lower. This, I would call this an anti-rotation link, where it has a pin sticking out here. The pin goes through this hole in the lock plate, and then a screw fastens the upper part of that. So it's, it's fastened here, and it's fastened here, and it's just a bar. Um, a lot of guys, when they're looking at these springs, they think the whole thing is the spring, and that's fine. That's one way of looking at it. But in my case, the upper part could be made out of really stiff balsa wood if you could figure out a way to weld it to an actual steel lower arm. The lower arm will sit down here, and its function is to actually drive the tumbler on the lock. So as we can see here, as we flex this beam, it will push down on this and cause this whole thing to rotate forward. The arch in the end of this spring's function, right now the distance from the bottom of that tail to the center line of that pivot is this much. It doesn't matter what it is, it's this much. We're going for degrees of magnitude. But when you cock the lock, the distance is now only this much. It's almost half as much right there. So it's the difference between this and this. So you have a lot more leverage when the hammer is down when you need the velocity, when the flint's coming across the frizzing, you need the velocity down at the bottom. But when you come back to full cock, you don't have very much leverage, so it's relatively easy for this compression sear to be able to hold full cock, um, which reduces uh, strain on all of this and makes this an easier lock to pull through. There are other ways of doing this variable geometry. We'll take this lock, for instance. They have a toggle bar here that swings. So you can see then that the difference between where I'm pulling to here gets dramatically smaller as you cock this lock. It's a very small distance here and then it accelerates through and pops down. All right, so now we know why this shape is here and we know why these shapes are here and the rest of it's fabrication. We've made one of these in the past, and I'm going to tell you that I did not temper it correctly and I snapped it because I was teaching a student about these springs. And we may very well in the finished product actually wind up using this upper limb. So we've made this mistake, this is broken. The first thing we're going to do is cut this off and grind it flat right here, and then I'll show you where we're going to go from there. I'm going to get asked this, so I'm just going to show you how to fabricate this piece if you had to actually make it. You could saw this thing out of a solid block of steel that's about the size of this piece of wood. You could do that. But the cheater's way to do this is to cut a notch. I'm gonna cut a notch right here.
So I've got a notch there. And then I think it'll really show up better if I just hang it off the, uh, I'll hang it off the top right here. So we wanna make this piece and we want the tab, we're gonna make it that way and we want the tab to wind up in the back. So remember that. Turning the lights off gives you a better look at the actual color of the steel. Get it heated up here. The vise is wicking off a tremendous amount of energy. So the top part up above that notch will heat up a lot faster than the lower bunch. We want to make this piece right there. That's what we're trying to form. So I'm holding that there to remind myself to turn this thing clockwise when I grab it. I gotta get a little bit hotter than this. Let me get that tab nice and hot right there. And the whole bottom is starting to glow. So once you get it there, you just, um, here we go, run this around like that bang and we went clockwise and we have now made that part and i'm not kidding it's about like that now we can tweak it we can bend it over but we're going to cut all this there's a lot of things that are going to get cut here so that'll work you just heat it up and do it that that works for frizz and springs that works for everything it's got to be hot if you try to do this cold it's it's just going to snap on you well, I've got this thing up here on a vise. I'm going to make a couple of coupons because we're going to want to see something a little bit later. Yeah, wait a minute. While well, I'm still heating that up, let me set that down there. I just put the torch here, standing straight up. So we've got a fire source here that's being controlled by the universal work holding system. And then we can grab this piece here and warm it up. So I'm going to make two test coupons out of the same kind of steel because we're gonna um, uh, quench both of these, heat them up and quench, but we're only gonna draw the temper back on one of them because I'm gonna show you why you've gotta draw the temper back on a spring. So we'll just, um, trying to bend this so that you guys can see what I'm doing, but there we go, there we go. We we'll heat that up, and I want to just bend this around. Now, this is how springs were traditionally made. They were bent. They were bent. Um, and just brought into brought into contact with each other like this. And it's a perfectly valid way of doing it. And I have my reasons for doing it the way I'm about to do it because it's quicker, it's faster, and. I think it's more precise because I don't know where in this bend this thing is going to wind up. Right. I'm trying to avoid beating on this thing if I can get away with it, but I'm going to have to tap on it a little bit. But these are just the test coupons. I want to show you guys some. Okay. All right, there we go. Yes, I've just ruined this pair of pliers. This pair of pliers is useless. These had already had all their temper drawn on them. Don't put your good pliers up here near the fire. You'll wind up breaking them. So there's one, and then I'm going to make another one. So we're going to have two of these. Now, one of these, it's got its ends bent. You see how I ground off the end on that? That's going to be important because that's how we're going to keep these two apart. So the one that has been cut with that end will be the one that we're going to uh, temper in a lead pot. And this is going to be the one that we don't. I'm going to bend a little bit more that way. There we go.
pretty close. I want to make them the same so that it's an apples to apples comparison. I'm just going to draw this toe. And that's all we need to know about it. We don't need to know everything else. We just need to know that the tumbler is essentially right here and there's the center line of the tumbler. And this toe sticks up. And I want to remember that because we have to clear that. When this, when this toe is all the way down, it's down here. So the spring has to bridge the gap from right here to right here and not run into this arc right there at the closest point of approach. We don't want to do that. So when the thing is all the way cocked, we want to be touching as close as we can. We want to arch up over this and back down and then have the, the, the bottom limb come in like this. So this is where we want to be. Bang. So that's what the top part of the spring is going to look like. And if we look at the original, we're pretty close to what the original looked like. I'm changing the engineering a little bit, and I'm going to put the peak of this back a little bit further just so I can reach up over that bar because you don't want this to slip off. The consequences of this coming off of this toe in service or this spring breaking is it will blow the bottom slap out of the stock. That's the first thing I want to show you. And the second thing is we rotated this bar, right? And we want to put a we want to put a locating pin there. So we've got, so let me move this towel a little bit here and get you on a fresh picture. Here we go right so here's the top of this thing and there's our tab and it we bent it right there and then this kicks all the way back like this right so there's a tendency this spring has got to taper a little bit how thick this thing is is meaningless so what we're going to do we know we want that that tab to be right there make a saw cut there make a saw cut there and grind or file off everything here. And just reduce its thickness ever so slightly and then you wind up with a spring with a tab sticking out of it that can then be filed around. Once you get that located on the hole, so that tab is gonna go into that hole right there, then, and it's, this is a little bit bigger, there's the threaded hole then when you know where the threaded hole is inside the lock, once you get this tab right and you plug it in, then you drill the hole where the threaded hole in the lock plate is. And now you got something that fits, you got something that fits, you hand fit all that, and you don't worry about how long this is. We'll go back and we'll cut that off here in a little bit. That piece was already fabricated for us previously. We've already got this fabbed. I'm just showing you how to get from this to this. I don't want to take the time right now to do that. So I got to get on with it. I got a perfectly good upper piece here, but that's how it's fabricated. I don't want to screw you out of that. This gets bent up. You do a little bit of creative file work. You cut away the parts there in black and you're left with that little silver piece. I'm back up on my large machinist universal work holding system and I'm just going to heat this um, bar of spring steel up if you're wondering where to find spring steel, old lawnmower blades, edger blades, uh, circular saw blades were great. They come in a variety of thicknesses. I buy my spring stock from Brownells in 12 packs just because it's easier and I don't have to go hunt it. But I got, if you're in this game as long as I've been in it, you've got stacks of stuff everywhere. Now it's easiest to bend in the places where the heat is. And I know that sounds a little bit familiar. Why aren't I using an oxycetylene torch? That's too much heat. And I don't want to get this, this torch won't heat this up hot enough to ruin it quickly. So I'm gonna put my first bend in it and this is gonna be the back bend right here. This is gonna be my back bend. So we're coming down the long, the long axis of the spring. Gonna tighten that up a little bit. Okay. 
There we go. Now, if you wanted to make that a really tight turn, you could just open this up, drop it down on the vise, and tighten that up. Now, don't hit it. You don't want to hit it too hard because you don't want to kink this here and rip the steel. And you don't want to create a stress riser. A sharp turn there will create a stress riser. So I've tightened that up a little bit. And we're going to heat it back up again. And this has taken all that um, work that I put into it. I, I, I work hardened it. <clears throat> again, I got a pair of pliers that are already pre ruined, so I don't have to worry about getting them hot. Um, don't do this with your good stuff. I've got the lights turned off. You can start seeing that orange flame starting to draw there. And again, the vise is your friend because you can use the vise to protect pieces that you don't want to get hot. In this case, it's a trade-off between um, how rigid I'm hanging on to it and how much heat I'm bleeding off. So all I'm just going to do now is roll this over and let it heat back up. Now, yeah, we're going to grind the end of that off. There's, there's no way you're going to nail this landing right on the first attempt. So you can't cut it to length. And anybody that's ever uh, um, tried to thread a piece of pipe without, the, um, without knowing how long it's got to be, and then they have to hang the, the, uh, the pipe threading machine over the end of the building, and you've got this eight-foot piece of conduit going around in circles hanging off the end of a building. And I have to tell you, some of the best looking conduit that I have ever bent is still hanging in the warehouse. <laughs> okay, so I've got the bend I want. And then we're just going to come in and, and cut this end off right here until we get it where we want it. So now we have our bend and we want to touch there. Well, it's too long. It's getting into the, to the uh, lock nail hole here. So we're going to trim a little bit off the end of this until this protrusion right here just doesn't touch the spring when this is as far in there as we can get it. So a little bit of creative grinding, I'd say we'd have to take about 100, uh, we, we're just gonna have to take a little bit off here. All right, you can hear the grinder spooling down and we're right there and it's gonna touch and that's gonna be exactly what we want right there. See, we got it just not falling off right there and just not touching the back right there. That's exactly what we're looking at. It's not binding here, it's not binding there. Nice and smooth, everything's cool. Okay, so we've got that. Now what we're gonna do is combine that with our pre-existing piece that we already had, which is this guy right here. And that's gonna drop in to the locating hole and that's starting to look like a repaired spring right there. We'll bring this to the bottom and say, okay, it's still touching. So that's us. And we'll just, we'll put a clamp on this and we'll be done. And if I'd actually had a clamp with me when I said that, we'd have been okay. So now I've clamped it to where the locating pin hangs onto it. It just sweeps past right here and it just touches down there, and this is actually perfect. So now we're gonna cut this to length, and we're gonna find out why TIG welders make us worthless and weak. <laughs> So now we have this stack and we're not really going to worry about how that limb is bent yet. We'll put a slight curve in that. If you make this spring, if you force this spring to bend this way, like this, 
you will blow the back of it. And a lot of springs that are folded over do that. They break right there. So I'm going to use my hands and tell you that it's the difference between the spring bending like this and bending like that. And if you see the difference, the joint down here isn't moving. We're shooting for that. If we get that, it is only a matter of time until that spring lets go back here from fatigue. That's what we're trying to avoid. So we're going to weld this thing up. And then when we open the limbs up, we're going to make sure that just past the weld does not open up and it's always in physical contact. And then we don't have to worry about that work, uh, that work hardening back here that will eventually make it snap. Now we switch to oxyacetylene, so we're going to need a little bit more. So I've got the spring clamped in the universal work holding system here so that it can't bend back in that weld. I'm only putting the heat where I want the bend to happen. So we need a lot more heat because we're fighting the vise. Normally I quench in a plastic tub. I've got my uh, yogurt tubs. The problem is this spring is going to be so hot that when I get it in that tub, it'll, it'll melt the hole right out the bottom. Yes. Yes, it will. <laughs> I've done that before. All of a sudden there's water everywhere. How embarrassing. I'm going to put just a little bit more of a bend in it here. I measured it up against the lock. And you want that curve to be smooth. You want to kind of have sort of a sweep to it. Again, no discontinuities. You kill the lights there. And we don't care about the top. I don't care about this upper limb right here. I don't care about that. We'll get it all hot, but I don't really care what the upper limb does. Here we go. I'm running this torch a little bit rich because I don't want to burn the carbon out of this. All I want to do is get it hot. I don't want to burn the carbon out of it and if it starts sparkling. So the difference between propane and acetylene is about 2,500, 3,000 degrees and where it dumps its heat, you've got to stay moving. If this thing sparkles, I, we're starting to burn the carbon and I don't want to do that. Okay, so now we're getting pretty close here. We get it all hot. A lot more mass back here. You can see it's turning orange all the way through. So we know we've got heat transfer. That's a good solid weld. You can see how much of the weld we've got back there. And now we'll get the rest of this limb hot. And I'm staying away from up front here. We don't care how hard or how springy that is. What we really care about is this piece of the this piece right here. There we go. We're getting up above yellow. We're into that orange zone. We get it, and then when it's time to drop it, drop it and get on with it. Now, we're going to do our coupons. And these look like just every other flat spring you've ever seen, and I've left them open at the base because I want to prove a point. I didn't close them up. And for small springs, you can get away with this shape. But for the bigger springs, that open bottom down there is going to really get you in trouble. Now at this point, the springs that are sitting in that water are as hard as a piece of glass. And the bigger ones, if you drop them on the ground, they'll shatter, they'll break. There's also you can quench in oil. Some springs tell you to quench in oil. Oil cools the spring down slower. So right now we'll let all that cool off. I'll kill my torch here and we'll retrieve them. Yeah, we 
with just a settling smoke everything on a bench there. So now we go in and we have a very hard spring. If you flex this, this will snap. So I'll go run a wire wheel and I'll just kiss all of this off and get this kind of shiny so we can see it turn colors as we anneal it. I'll do all, um, I'll do all three of these. This is just a casting pot, Mark 1, Mod 0. And one of the beautiful things about drawing temper in lead is that you can get a very precise temper on it and it will do the whole spring regardless of the, regardless of its cross section. So we're gonna let that wind out. Now, depending on what book you read, tempering a spring should be done at about 585 to 625 it depends on what book you read, and it depends upon when they wrote it before World War II, and it depends upon the calibration of their thermometer. This thermometer's calibration is traceable back to the floor I'm standing on right now. We don't really know, but I know that in my lead pot, set at about four and a half on my thermometer, with my instrumentation, I know that I get good results when that says about 650 and I'm using all the abouts, the amongs, the befores because at the end of the day we really don't know. We're actually going to go on color. Important safety tip, that's hot. Okay, anyway. So steel will actually float on lead because of the difference in density. So we can just let that float and I don't know if we're gonna be able to pick the color changes up with the setup we've got right now, but we're gonna try. And we're not doing the one coupon. We are mer merely doing the two springs that we went ahead and tempered. And I'm just gonna float that. Now that solder will flick off because as we have discovered earlier, if there's any cleanliness issues on the surface of that steel, the solder will not stick to it. We've been through that before. This is going to sit here for a good five or 10 minutes. But the important thing to see here is that that's already beginning to turn blue. This has a lot more mass and it's going to take a lot longer. You got to let this soak all the way through. You can see this blue color starting to creep in right here. That's the color we want it. Think any one of those spring clips that you get from um, the uh, office goods store and they're all drawn back to this blue. <clears throat> I have an induction set up. And I can do this in an induction format, but the average guy's got a lead pot or has access to one. If you're watching this channel, the average, uh, the average shooter, reloader, gun maintenance guy, and about 2% of my viewers are now ladies. And welcome aboard, ladies. So when I say guys, you're one of the guys. If you're watching me, <laughs> you're one of the guys. We'll be back in about 10 minutes. We're gonna let these things sit here and float. So uh, there's gonna be a fade right here. We will let that continue to draw mm -hmm. and then we can see then that we can pick these up and knock them off and that one i'll tell you is done this one we're going to let this big one sit here for a little bit longer because yeah and it's cool too because you can push this all the way under and it'll pop right back up it'll just sit there and ah, ah. so now we got to let the we got to let the players heat up enough to get the freaking lead ah let the lead get off of them, right? Important safety tip. Do not shut this pot off and go home or you will be unable to extricate the springs. Now, if you want to complete a kneel, you would run this up to about 800, 900 degrees and then you would shut the pot off and let it cool all the way down to zero and then come in tomorrow morning and turn it on just enough to break, the, break it loose. And it would take all night for it to cool off nice and slow okay we're going to take that one out and we don't want it to cool off very fast so i'm just going to set it down on the bench this guy we're going to let this guy sit in here a little bit longer because what what i found is is that that solder line right there so we're going to flip this thing over here let's flip it over ah. this is a hot sticky mess but it works and, and all that solder will just flick right off. I'll be able to just wire wheel that all right off.
All right, there you go. It's blue all the way through from the bottom to the top. It's blue all the way around. We have now drawn the temper on this spring back a little bit to the blue point. Now, resist the temptation to want to take this thing and dunk it in water right now to cool it off. You have to let it cool down. So I just set it down on the wood of the bench back here and we'll let it sit there for 10 or 15 minutes. And then when that's cool, we'll meet you back over at the vise and I want to show you something. All right, because I'm trying to demo this, it's not going to work, but you don't flex a big spring like this right away. But you should be able to get to the point where you can flex this spring down and almost snatch it damn near flat and it'll keep coming back. So that spring's actually working pretty good, All right? We have heat treated this by heating it up and quenching it. And then now we've gotten it down to the point where we can damn near smash it flat in the vise and it'll keep coming, it'll keep coming open unless you don't temper it enough and then it'll explode. So that one exploded because we didn't temper it enough and this one will definitely explode. Bing, that one just blew up before we even flexed it at all. So what that just told me was, is I got to get that big spring back in the pot for a little bit more temper action. This is our completed spring. Um, I'm going to tell you that I've knocked the solder off it. I just went over and just scooped off the solder. There's still little flecks of it right here. And we polished the back of it just ever so slightly to make everything look smooth. We've got our hook, we've got everything. When you've got a spring that's this big and it has this much weight to it, you can't just load it up immediately. We're gonna drop a spring cramp on it. And we're gonna go ahead and put a little bit of tension on it, just enough that we can set it up on the lock here and have a little bit more. That rain you hear in the background is gonna mean that we're not gonna be able to shoot this thing. Cause I love you guys, but I'm not gonna take the chance on tying a 212 year old gun up just because I wanted to make some uh, make some we have cartridges loaded for it and everything we're not gonna be able to shoot it though and uh, the, the weather isn't gonna support it okay so now we've got the spring mounted in the lock here and I'm gonna reach around the top of this you don't just cock this you begin to walk up on it here let's put a little bit of oil on this there was a little bit on the lock plate I'm just gonna throw a little bit of oil down right there to uh, lubricate this toe but you got to sneak up on this so you flex it and as you can see the, the wind up begins back here and it lays it all the way out flat let me do, let me reach around this see how that spring starting to wind up like that yeah there we go we're not flexing anything back here all of that weight is coming on right there we'll just keep flexing it and you'll feel okay now we've made the half cock notch and then we can go a little bit more let me get this thing down go a little bit more there's the half cock and then there it is now we're in full so let's see if this thing will spark oh yeah check that noise out so we've gone from just basically a bar of steel and we've wound up with a completed spring that's been heat treated and tempered. And when it comes to springs, I got news for you. Churchill was right. Success with life or springs is the ability to move serially from failure to failure with no loss of enthusiasm. Outstanding. We fabricated a spring for an 1812 unmodified lock. Pretty decent. And I'm going to tell you what, as always, it's been a pleasure.